Good evening, I'm Ellison Barber, in for Tom Yamas. Tonight, a massive cleanup effort underway in Baltimore after the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The largest crane on the East Coast arriving today, highlighting the massive undertaking that lies ahead. The Army Corps of Engineers facing an incredibly complex job, fully assessing the debris pieces to determine how to safely remove it from the water. Also tonight, this urgent warning, officials alerting neighboring communities to not touch debris that is now washing up on shore. The governor of Maryland emphasizing the unprecedented scale of this salvage mission, removing 4,000 tons of steel hanging on the cargo ship ever since it plowed into that bridge. The families of the four missing construction workers hoping this wide-scale operation will help recover their loved ones and finally bring them some closure amid their tragic loss. NBC's Tom Costello is in Baltimore to start us off tonight. Arriving at the site of Baltimore's bridge collapse, the biggest floating crane on the East Coast, able to lift a thousand tons for one of the biggest salvage missions ever. Just part of a flotilla now en route, including the crane that lifted the miracle on the Hudson Plain out of the river. In all, seven floating cranes, 10 tugboats, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard boats. 8,000 local jobs are waiting. We need to clear the channel and open the vessel traffic to the port because the health of the Maryland economy and the national economy depend on it. On the water, the Army Corps of Engineers is using underwater drones and sonar to map the precise location of the wreckage, then lay out a coordinated salvage plan for divers. How we can cut it up into the pieces we need to be able to lift. NTSB investigators still interviewing crew members and gathering evidence on the crushed cargo ship, now trapped under the weight of twisted steel, a piece of highway lying on top. So take a look at the front of the ship, at the, at the bow of the ship, and you see that piece of steel that's lying across it. That's three to 4,000 tons. That is so heavy, it's pushing the bow into the water, down into the bottom of the river, and then it's lifting the stern up out of the water. Below the waterline, the river depth is roughly 50 feet. To reopen the port, the cranes will lift massive chunks of steel, concrete, and sunken cargo containers, some hazardous. All of it must be gone. The sand on the bottom, completely clean. You can't leave any concrete, any steel, because it, it's, a, it's a threat to the vessel. We're going to get it all off the bottom and reopen this channel so it provides for safe navigation. Meanwhile, in Honduras, construction worker Menor Martin Suazo's family in a heart-wrenching wait for his body to be recovered from the water in Baltimore. His brother saying, we are still waiting with faith and hope that they will find his body so we can bring him home. And Tom joins us now from Baltimore. Tom, we can see that crane over your shoulder, a reminder of just this enormous undertaking ahead. There are still four victims yeah. unaccounted for, lost underneath that water. And now we know the president is going to come to Baltimore soon. Do we know when that could happen? Yeah, that's right. Next week, uh, President Biden says he will be coming next week, presumably to meet with not only the search teams, Coast Guard, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, the governor, of course, potentially also family members and, and emergency responders who were on the bridge at 1.30 in the morning on Tuesday. Can I just make the point, as you suggested, that is it right there. That is the 1,000-ton crane, the biggest on the East Coast. It is here. It is on site. And the plan is to eventually move it into position. I'm going to ask Rudy to show you the other side here. And he's shooting into the sun, so bear with him. But you can see that's the bridge and that's the ship. So that crane is right here, ready to move, but it is only one piece of this massive flotilla that will take shape. Wow, so amazing to just see that up close behind you. <clears throat> Can you talk to us a little more about the emergency funds that Maryland has from the federal government? Where do things stand financially? What else do they need to continue their work? I mean, that crane, that is not something that isn't going to cost a lot of money to use, right? Yeah. 100%, you're right. Uh, so the federal government, President Biden, has already approved the first $60 million in emergency aid to Maryland, uh, and that will be a drop in the bucket, uh, not nearly enough. The total price tag at this point is estimated when, when they actually have to rebuild the bridge, probably well over a billion, maybe one and a half billion dollars. These are just ballpark figures, right? They don't even have the design yet for a new bridge. They don't have any estimate out there, and no, no, no offers, if you will. 
but it is going to cost an extraordinary amount of money. And as you've heard, uh, we've also heard Secretary uh, Buttigieg suggesting that if an, an individual company is found any way responsible and liable, they could also be held accountable, potentially financially accountable as well. Tom Costello, senior correspondent. Thank you. And as the chaos in Haiti continues, we have new reporting on the work U.S. officials are doing to try and stop the weapons that get into the hands of those gang members. A U.N. report last year found most of the guns used by the gangs there have been smuggled into Haiti illegally from the United States and Florida in particular. Tonight, our Guad Venegas is in Miami, getting exclusive access inside the operation by the Department of Homeland Security to cut off that flow of illegal weapons. What you're seeing here is the fuel of a lot of the violence you're seeing down in Haiti and the Caribbean. It's the source of power for the gangs tormenting Haiti. An arms race to create an arsenal that ensures control. We have 338 sniper rifle, 308s as well, very high caliber weapon used by a lot of militaries. Also a 308 belt fed machine gun. It's older, but it's very functional and obviously a very potent weapon in the wrong hands. What looks like a high caliber gun show is instead evidence seized by Homeland Security investigations in Miami. All of these intended to be shipped to Haiti. This is one of the most unique port of entries in the United States. Special agent in charge, Anthony Salisbury, taking NBC News on an exclusive in-depth look at the colossal task to stop the gun smuggling. Is this a daily occurrence that you guys are finding weapons? It's a very regular regular occurrence. It, it Sometimes daily, ebb and flow with it. But yeah, it wouldn't be uncommon to get daily weapon seizures coming out of Miami. This is one of the weapons seized by U.S. authorities. It's a 50 cal Barrett anti-material rifle. This can shoot through walls, cinder block, and vehicles. If purchased legally in the U.S., it'll cost about $12,000. But once smuggled into Haiti, gang members will pay anywhere from thirty dollars to $40,000 for it. It's estimated a large portion of those weapons are smuggled on freighter ships that depart from a five-mile strip of the Miami River that also serves as a port of entry and exit to Haiti and the Caribbean. It's the last shipping mechanism like this in the United States. It's known as break bulk cargo, meaning it's not containerized, very informal shipping mechanism that's utilized to ship goods down to Haiti typically secondhand goods, and makes it very difficult for us to do our job in order to determine if any illicit weapons, money, or transiting down to Haiti. A report released last March by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime finding the principal source of firearms and munition in Haiti is in the U.S. and in particular Florida. Last week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis telling NBC News he wants the federal government to do more. In terms of what is going into the country from the United States, that's something that is the, the federal government's responsibility uh, for that. So if this 308 was inside one of the boxes we saw in the warehouse, the boxes were about this big, right? Yep. If you were to put one in there, is there a machine that can detect that? Or how would you find that inside a pallet of boxes in the middle of a warehouse? Well, all those packages you saw would have to be broken apart on the pallet. And so imagine all that. Imagine breaking down all those pallets one by one, loading up one box at a time, rolling it through an extra. We don't have the resources. With substantial purchasing power, Salisbury says the gangs have been hard to defeat and that a lot more work still needs to be done. What I can tell you is we have dozens and dozens of open weapons trafficking investigations for the Caribbean alone. We'd have to stop doing all of our priorities, which includes human trafficking, uh, narcotics trafficking, child exploitation. So again, that's why we, HSI, we focus on trying to identify the networks that are actually moving these weapons. Guad Venegas joins us now from Miami. Guad, first of all, this is an amazing eye-opening report, and you really gave people a unique, in-depth look at how these illegal weapons are smuggled in from the port of Miami, something not a lot of people get to see up close. But as you know, that is not the only way these guns are getting into Haiti. So what did the agents you spoke to have to say about some of the other methods smugglers seem to be using here? Ellison, and we also saw how challenging their job is. So the special agent I spoke to said that we have to think about the fact that the smugglers are also using airplanes and they can also ship a lot of the weapons through land. If you look at the map, Haiti shares a border with the Dominican Republic. You were just there at the border. There's more than 240 miles of border that can be used by a lot of these criminal organizations to get the weapons into the Dominican Republic first and then into Haiti. Now, the biggest challenge here for the authorities in the U.S. for Customs and Border Protection 
Protection and Homeland Security investigators is the fact that they have to allow a lot of these freighters and shipments to go to Haiti because of that humanitarian aid, right? Haiti needs a lot of these items, including food, that are coming in. So they have to allow that while they try to identify which shipments have weapons. Now, one of the things that they have done is focused a lot of their attention on the money because these weapons are being sold for so much. They have been able to track a lot of these organizations or criminal groups by finding where the money is going. But again, it's, again, it's, it's a colossal task to be able to stop these weapons with all of that flow of humanitarian aid that needs to be going to Haiti. Ellison. Guad Venegas, amazing reporting. Thank you. To politics now and the historic fundraiser for President Biden last night at Radio City Music Hall. Biden joined by two of his predecessors, Presidents Obama and Clinton, in an effort to shore up Democratic support and raise some campaign cash. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell has this story. With a dramatic flourish, three presidents emerged. Democratic donors posted their images of this entrance at a glitzy New York City fundraiser, needling a fourth president, Donald Trump, with a twist on the sensitive issue of age. In this clip released by the Biden campaign. I mean, all the things he's doing are so old. Speaking of old. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a little old and out of shape, but anyway. Tapping into the political skills of Bill Clinton and Barack Obama to sell the Biden agenda. Democrats looking for a counterpoint to polling that shows voter frustrations with President Biden. You've got record-breaking job growth. You've got an unemployment rate that is as low as it has been. For African Americans, by the way, the lowest on record ever. Tickets started at $250, but donations soared as high as a half million for the star-studded night. The event raised $26 million, while outside a large and loud protest over President Biden's policy on the Israel-Hamas war. Meanwhile, former President Trump created his own contrast, joining mourners grieving NYPD officer Jonathan Diller, who was shot and killed, the suspect a repeat offender. Mr. Trump slamming President Biden for not directly reaching out to the Dillers. They could have called. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know. Even a call would be perhaps nice. I'm not sure they'd take his call. And Kelly O'Donnell joins us now from the White House. Kelly, what else are we learning about the types of people actually donating to the Biden campaign? Well, in the overall $26 million this one event brought in, campaign officials say about a third of the people in that group were what they call small dollar donors, less than $200 in their contribution. And overall, in this campaign season, they've accumulated about 1.3 million donors. And they say 500,000 of those are first time donors to the Biden campaign. And their argument is they are able to attract new support, even at a time when the president's poll numbers have been lagging. Ellison. Kelly O'Donnell, thank you. Moving overseas now to the escalating violence in the Middle East. In Syria tonight, Israeli airstrikes killing more than 40 people, including some members of Hezbollah. The attack on the country, one of the worst it's seen in recent years, now stoking fears of a wider conflict in the region. NBC international correspondent Raf Sanchez is in Israel with more. Tonight, as casualties mount in Gaza, growing danger this war could spread to a second front. In northern Syria, Israel allegedly striking in the city of Aleppo. A monitor group says it's the largest such attack in years, killing 36 Syrian soldiers and six militants from Iranian-backed Hezbollah. Israel isn't commenting, but hours later targeting this car in southern Lebanon. Israel saying they took out a Hezbollah commander responsible for rocket attacks on Israeli civilians. The militants confirming his death and vowing revenge. Hezbollah in Lebanon is aligned with Hamas, but it's larger and more powerful and has been striking Israel, which has been firing back since the Hamas terror attacks on October 7th. Fighting intensifying this week with funerals for civilians on both sides of the border. Nearly 200,000 Israelis and Lebanese have been displaced by the conflict, leaving Israeli villages like Hanida a ghost town. The only residents left are part of security patrols. Is it sad for you to see it like this? Of course, we like our community. We want to live together. 
We follow them into an abandoned house and up the stairs. The border with Lebanon is just a couple hundred yards away over that fence, well within range of Hezbollah's mortars. And the Israeli military says it was one of those mortars that crashed through the roof of this house, destroying the top floor. These are the tiles that were once the roof. No way to rebuild with threats of war hanging overhead. And Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv, Israel. Raf, you said in the piece that fighting has been escalating. Is there any sort of off-ramp here, a way possibly to avoid a war between Israel and Hezbollah? Well, Ellison, the Biden administration certainly hopes so. It has been one of their absolutely top diplomatic priorities since October 7th to make sure this war does not spread to Lebanon. The good news here is that Hezbollah has indicated if there's a ceasefire in Gaza, it is prepared to cease fire also. That's what happens with that last short truce back in November. The bad news is Israel is saying a ceasefire is not enough. It says after the horrors of October 7th, its tolerance for risk have totally changed, and Hezbollah needs to not just stop shooting, but it needs to move way back from the Israeli border. Now, there is actually a U.N. Security Council resolution from 2006 which says Hezbollah needs to do just that. It hasn't been enforced, and the position of the Israeli government is if there can be a diplomatic deal to move Hezbollah back, that's great. If not, Israel is prepared to mount a major military operation into southern Lebanon. Elsa. Raf Sanchez, thank you. Now to the latest on Russia's ongoing detention of Evan Gershkovich. Today marks one year since the Wall Street Journal reporter was arrested by Russian authorities. Tonight, the symbolic front page on the journal marking the anniversary and the efforts by U.S. officials to bring him back home. NBC News chief foreign affairs correspondent Andrea Mitchell has the latest. On today's first anniversary of Evan Gershkovich's arrest in Russia, the Wall Street Journal's front page was mostly blank white columns where his reporting should have been, and a searing story on what Evan has lost during a year in jail. Journalism is not a crime. Prominent journalists gathered at the Wall Street Journal this week for a 24-hour readathon of Evan's work. A year is a long time for his parents. Do you think they're doing enough? We have a commitment from the U.S. government. We know they're working hard, and we just uh, want them to continue doing Last month, the possibility of a trade was raised in an Oval Office meeting between President Biden and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Two sources tell NBC News Scholz for the first time considered giving up a Russian assassin Putin wants, who's in a German prison, in exchange for Alexei Navalny. The U.S. wanted the deal to also include Evan and Paul Whelan, an American businessman imprisoned in Russia for what the U.S. says are false espionage charges. A week later, Navalny died, the sources say, before the trade was proposed to the Kremlin. Today, President Biden's message for Evan and his family. Did you ever think it would last this long? We knew that it was going to be a marathon, but still had hopes that it will be sooner. Tonight, Congress's four leaders in a rare bipartisan statement saying reporters are not bargaining chips and calling on the Kremlin to release Evan and all who are wrongfully detained. Allison. Andrea Mitchell, thank you. We're going to turn now to the severe weather threat out west. Heavy rainfall set to impact central and coastal California this weekend. Flood watches in effect for 21 million people, plus winter alerts issued in the mountains where up to two feet of snow could fall. For more on the spring storm system, NBC News meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us now. So, Angie, what is the latest? What do people need to know heading into the weekend? Yeah, it's a busy holiday weekend, Ellison. We know there's going to be lots of travel, so people need to know that there's going to be heavy Heavy rain specifically across parts of the west. We've got a low pressure system that's already ramped up the rain across the Bay Area. We've got preemptive flood watches in effect for Southern California. You can see from San Luis Obispo all the way to San Diego, those 21 million people under a flood watch as we gear up for some heavy rain to work in here as we get into the later parts of tonight and into tomorrow. Notice your Saturday. It's going to be soggy across parts of California. We'll also see parts of the Rockies pick up some additional snow. But our biggest concern for the flooding, L.A. to San Diego. That's where we'll watch for landslides. 
landslides, mudslides with three to five inches of rain possible. Parts of the southwest are also going to pick up some rain. Nothing quite as impressive as what we'll see in the mountains and foothills, though, of Southern California. Again, watching for those washed out roads. On top of that, that spring snow. Yep, we got it about a foot to two feet possible across the Sierra range. And one other trouble spot that we're going to watch across parts of the Great Lakes and into the northeast. We've got this that we're going to watch a little disturbance that works across the northeast for tomorrow. Bring some rain. It's mainly going to be in the afternoon hours from New York to New Jersey. By the time we get into Sunday, Easter Sunday, that is, we'll have to watch for this stalled out front to bring us some rain showers across parts of the Midwest. Otherwise, some temperatures across this region, Ellison, they're running 10 to 15 degrees above normal for folks this weekend. Angie Lassman, thank you. Still ahead tonight, the deadly police shootout caught on camera. A man barricading himself inside a Florida motel room and firing at officers. What his ex-wife is saying tonight about his history of mental illness and her attempts to have his guns taken away. Plus, a new push to crack down on immigration in Georgia after nursing student Lake and Riley was allegedly killed by a man who was undocumented. The bill now heading to the governor's desk. And the airboat flipping on its side in the Florida Everglades, the race to get passengers out of the alligator-infested waters. Stay with us. We're back now with the latest push to tighten Georgia's already strict immigration laws in the wake of the nursing student Lakin Riley's death. An undocumented immigrant in custody tonight accused of killing the 22-year-old near the University of Georgia's campus. Her case igniting a fiery debate over immigration in the state and beyond. NBC's Stephen Romo has more on the bill that's now headed to the governor's desk. At the Georgia State Capitol. Is this body, the House of the People, legally entitled to amend, circumvent, or repeal federal law? I don't know about that, but we're getting ready to do it if that's what you think. That was the question seconds before state lawmakers voted to push a controversial immigration bill to Republican Governor Brian Kemp's desk. The House Bill 1105. The measure passing on the last day of the legislative session amid ongoing fallout from the death of 22-year-old Lakin Riley, the University of Georgia nursing student who was found dead after going for a jog near her campus in Athens. Undocumented immigrant Jose Antonio Ibarra from Venezuela is charged with her murder. He had previously been arrested in 2022 for entering the U.S. without authorization, but was released on parole according to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. He's currently being held without bond. House Bill 1105 would require local law enforcement agencies to check the immigration status of people in their custody and cooperate with federal immigration authorities with added penalties of losing state or federal funding for failing to comply. This bill simply ensures that when individuals have committed crimes in Georgia, when we determine they are illegally in this country, that we fully work with federal immigration authorities. The bill getting pushed back on the floor right before the vote. A lot of concerns have been raised by law enforcement uh, that this bill will undermine their ability to keep their community safe by requiring them to essentially act as if they were uh, immigration law enforcement officers. Immigration advocates say the bill would make some communities less willing to report crime and work with local law enforcement. What was a personal tragedy for a family. I wish I could have been there to protect her is now a political flashpoint. My vision for every senator in this chamber is that you protect citizens from this illegal invasion. Riley's father even visiting the state Senate earlier this month asking them to pass the bill. President Biden responding on the fly during the State of the Union earlier this month to Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene's outburst on Riley's death. Say her name, becoming a rallying cry for Republicans hoping to get tighter immigration laws passed, reinforcing long-held fears many on the right have that immigration leads to an increase in crime. Fears that might not hold up to the data. Studies show no meaningful impact on homicide or robbery rates associated with sanctuary city policy. Policies. And Stephen Romo joins us now in studio. So, Stephen, Georgia has been looking at other penalties for other cities that 
don't adhere to immigration laws, right? Explain that to us. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, point, Ellison. Georgia's also passed House Bill 301. Now, that will give residents the ability to sue local governments, municipalities, if they're not following immigration laws. Now, that might sound familiar because back in 2021, Texas passed a law to allow residents to sue abortion providers. Now, very different topics here, but an interesting strategy of putting the onus on residents to go in and file these civil lawsuits if things aren't going exactly as these lawmakers planned. Ellison. Stephen Romo, thank you. Next, to shocking body camera footage out of Florida. It shows an intense shootout at a local hotel as police attempted to apprehend a man they say was armed and making concerning 911 calls. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson has more on what led up to this deadly encounter. Newly released police body cam video shows the tense shootout at a Florida Holiday Inn last week that left one man dead and an officer wounded. Please come out, come out with your hands up. The video, which was released and edited by Fort Lauderdale police, appears to show officers approaching a hotel room with 46-year-old Carl Kladinsky inside. Hands up, hands up, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands, let me see your hands. Police slowed down and narrated what they say happened next. The suspect opened the door with a phone in his left hand, a gun in his right. The suspect brings the gun down towards the officers. That's when police say officers fired at the suspect and the suspect fired back. Lodging this bullet in an officer's vest, police say. That officer was taken to the hospital and later released. The suspect was pronounced dead on the scene. The whole ordeal leaving hotel guests shaken. One of the staff members, there's a lot of people in there. She was like, everybody get into this conference room, get into this conference room. They put us in there, they locked it, turned the lights off. Police were called to the Holiday Inn last Thursday morning after Kladinsky told 911 dispatchers that he had killed someone in the room, police say. He's stating he has fully automated and three handguns with him and he will shoot. Dispatchers say Kladinsky was rambling saying that his wife was being raped and mentioned that he sees a therapist. Police say no victims were found in the room. He sees the door moving now and is about to shoot, saying if he sees the door move, he will shoot. Kladinsky's ex-wife tells our Miami station WTVJ her ex-husband struggled with drug use and mental health issues. He was in a hotel. He was on drugs. He was hallucinating. He was kind of like going off of this rampage that he always, always does thinks people are after him to kill him. Records show Kladinsky had several previous drug arrests and a risk protection order in 2022 that allowed police to confiscate all of his firearms. Documents show that order expired last year. I tried to tell them he does not need to have um, um, guns and he kept getting guns and then he would surrender the guns because I would say something and then he'd get guns again. The three officers involved in the shooting remain on paid leave, officials say, pending an investigation. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News. When we come back, a terrifying attack in New York City. A woman seen on surveillance video being chased down a street after she was followed from a subway station. How she managed to get away and the search tonight for that suspect. We're back now with Top Stories news feed, starting with another shocking attack on a woman here in New York City. Chilling new surveillance video shows a suspect chasing a woman down the street in Brooklyn. Police say the man began harassing that woman on a subway train, then followed her off of the train through the station and back onto the street. He eventually ran off when she tried to physically defend herself. It comes as New York City launched several security programs to try and increase subway safety. Several people rescued after an airboat overturned in the Florida Everglades. Aerial footage shows the boats on its side in alligator infested waters. One passenger says the boat flipped when they were trying to get a closer look at one of those gators. Luckily, no one was hurt and the group was rescued after about 10 minutes. And Kim Kardashian is being sued by the family of the late artist Donald Judd. During a video tour of her office space in 2022, Kardashian claimed her tables were designed by Judd. According to the suit, the Judd Foundation says they were actually, quote, unauthorized knockoffs and are suing her for making false claims. Kardashian declined to comment earlier this week. 
Turning now to the baffling underwater mystery, scientists are trying to figure out the strange phenomenon impacting fish in the Florida Keys, causing them to spin out of control and wash up dead. NBC's Marissa Parra traveled to the Keys to investigate. In the shimmering blue waters of the Florida Keys, long the jewel of Florida's southern coast, a mystery lurks beneath the surface. Fish with the spins, flipping and spinning without stop. In my lifetime of dives, I've never seen any behavior like this from fish at all. Diver Greg Furstenworth first observed it last year and soon learned the fish, including these small tooth sawfish, which can grow up to 16 feet, were dying. Scientists are struggling to understand why. It's unprecedented. They do not spin like this. They do not behave like this. This is not normal behavior at all. That highly unusual behavior has been seen in more than 40 species, according to Florida Fish and Wildlife. Necropsies on dead fish have revealed no sign of a pathogen or bacterial infection. State officials say oxygen levels, water salinity, pH, and temperature are not believed to be the cause, bewildering researchers. It's a mystery. There's so many different possibilities that it's really difficult to isolate which one it could be. 28 sawfish have been found dead, but the actual number believed to be even higher, a blow to this critically endangered species that was early in its road to recovery. So to see these animals dying could be a major setback. We want to get to the bottom of it and figure out uh, a way a way to, to come back from this. Fisheries in the Florida Keys remain open, though state officials say swimming where dead fish are observed isn't recommended. Why do we need to protect the ecosystem and the fish that live here? It's very special. Future generations need to be able to appreciate it the same way I did. Marissa Parra, NBC News, the Florida Keys. Now to top stories, Global Watch and the latest on the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian officials say Russian strikes targeted major power plants across Ukraine, severely damaging equipment and leaving parts of the country without electricity. The attack just a week after a Russian strike caused rolling blackouts in Ukraine's Kharkiv region. President Vladimir Zelensky now renewing calls for increased aid as Russia intensifies bombing on Ukraine's critical infrastructure. A massive fire engulfing a high-rise in northeastern Brazil. Video shows flames shooting out from multiple stories of the building in the city of Recife, sending thick clouds of smoke into the air and blazing debris to the ground. The building was reportedly under construction. According to local media, nearby buildings were evacuated as a precaution, but no one was hurt. And a luxury cruise line offering a suite for $1.7 million. The 4,000-square-foot suite from Regent Seven Seas will feature a personal butler, complimentary caviar, and in-suite spa services. The cruise itinerary is set to include stops in 40 countries over 20 weeks. You're looking for a budget option? Fares for one person start at more than $90,000. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. I'm Ellison Barber in New York for Tom Yamas. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.